Hello, and welcome to the lecture for chapter 26 of Conceptual Physical Science. In this chapter, we're going to cover our last module, our last chunk of the physical sciences, and that's astronomy. We have three chapters covering astronomy, 26, 27, and 28. And this also represents a change back to more of a fundamental science, closely, more closely related to physics, the topic we started this entire textbook with, this entire lecture series with, and also is a return to my own wheelhouse because I am a physics and astronomy professor. And so I certainly have a lot more background and confidence in teaching physics and astronomy as opposed to chemistry and geology. Well, then let's get into astronomy. Okay, so to start off on our three chapter journey of astronomy, we're gonna start with the solar system. So things that are closer to home. The solar system, we'll learn what that is, but you may know these are all the planets and other celestial bodies that are in orbit around the sun. The sun is a star, okay? There are many stars, stars make up galaxies. We'll talk about this more in chapter 27. Now, this is a great place to start because all of actual hands-on or engineering physical science involving astronomy takes place in the solar system. We have never left the solar system. We've never sent a probe or robot or anything outside of the solar system. Any sort of NASA or space science news that involves direct discovery is taking place inside the solar system. That of course includes discoveries on the, plant, the moons of the Jovian planets, which are Jupiter and Saturn, and also discoveries taking place on the surface of Mars or discussion of the atmospheres of Venus, all of this taking place in the solar system. And that's what we're trying to understand here in this following table of contents. Let's take a look. We've got the solar system and its formation. So this is just really a starting point. Just like we talked about how Earth may have formed, we're going to talk about how the solar system formed, okay? Including the formation of the planets, by the way, like Earth, the terrestrial planets. We'll then talk about the sun specifically, some aspects of, of how it gets its energy, for example, how it outputs so much light. The inner planets, including Earth, the outer planets like Jupiter, the Earth's moon, right? Now it's just one of many, many moons in the solar system. Some planets have a lot more moons than ours, but it's close to home. It's actually a very fascinating moon. And of course we care about it. And then we'll discuss a little bit an idea of a failed planet formation. How, why we have a certain number of planets, why maybe we don't have another number, another number of planets in our own solar system. Okay, so the solar system consists of the sun, a system of planets, okay, actual planets, asteroids and comets, okay? Now, there's also going to be dwarf planets, but they don't exactly have their own category. You would say they are either asteroid-like or they are comet-like. So in terms of core components of the solar system, this is actually a very good list, okay? Dwarf planets are just particularly large asteroids or particularly small comets or small planets, depending on how you think about it, okay? But we only have eight actual planets, in the solar system, okay? So that's the idea, is that we have just the planets, they're the major planets, they're the planets, and then we have other bodies, smaller pieces of matter. By the way, the sun makes up about 99% of the matter in the solar system. So the sun is, for all intents and purposes, to a rounding error, the solar system. Everything, including our own home planet, are just tiny leftovers of the massive structure that is the sun. Okay, so we can divide the planets into the inner and outer planets, which are the terrestrial and the Jovian planets. So the inner planets, we'll talk more about this, but are the terrestrial. By terrestrial, mean, we mean rocky. And then the outer planets are Jovian. And Jovian is just a term that means gassy. All right, so they're composed of, composed of gas. They don't, they don't have those rocky surfaces to them. Instead, they have cloud layers that eventually become very dense cloud layers, eventually become a liquid due to the increased pressure as you go down into those clouds, so it transitions into a, into a solid um, or into a liquid, and then eventually into a solid, because all the gas giants do have solid cores of just highly pressurized, well, we'll talk about what they are, but hydrogen and helium, okay? So those outer planets are these ones here. All right, the inner planets are these, right? We can see Earth's moon as well, right? A special case, we'll talk about that. Just a special case again, because it's, it's Earth's moon, it's our own moon close to home. Um, and also it's a very interesting moon, all right? By the way, the terrestrial planets don't have a lot of moons. By far, Earth's is the largest of the moons of the terrestrial planets, okay? You can see here the scale, the terrestrial planets are tiny compared to the Jovian planets and everything is tiny 
compared to the sun. Okay, this image here is to scale in terms of size, but not distance. Okay, so this is not the actual distance of these objects from the sun or each other. In fact, they're vast distances between. At this scale, if we were to include the distances between the planets, we would need to have a small city to encompass their actual distance. They'd be just these tiny little specks, right? You know, the size of a of a, a fleck of sand, a large fleck of sand in the case of Mercury, the size of a, a large marble in the case of Jupiter at this at the scale of, of the screen that at least I'm looking at, right? Depending on the, the size of the screen you're viewing this lecture on. But the point being that at, at a scale similar to this, we'd have to fill up, you know, kilometers of distance to actually fit the entire solar system. So there's there's tiny little planets with vast openness in between. Okay. And by the way, the sun at that scale would be the size of like a, um, you know, like a beach ball or something. Okay. So back to the idea that which we said was going to be the first topic, the formation of the solar system. Where did it come from? So in other words, we've got some of the basics of the solar system out of the way, the major classifications. Let's talk about the story of how the solar system came to be. Okay. So the theory is that the sun and planets formed together from a cloud of gas and dust, a nebula. Okay, so it's not like the sun came first and the planets came later. It's not like the sun gave birth to the planets somehow, like spewing them out. It all happened together. There was a swirling of gas and dust due to the laws of physics. Things crashed together, coalesced, got pulled together by gravity. And, well, the sun was formed from most of the gas and the leftovers formed everything else. Okay, let's talk about that more. So the nebular theory, the formation theory, how our solar system came to be, okay, says that gravitation between materials in a cloud pulled it inward, okay? So we had a large cloud to begin with. That cloud then became smaller as gravity condensed, pulled it in, and eventually that cloud became smaller still, all right? And the core of that cloud was able to collapse in on itself, becoming incredibly hot and dense because as things get, as a certain amount of gas gets confined in a smaller space, it heats up. Eventually that gas has become, became so small, so hot, so dense, it became the sun, all right? And it be, and fusion began. Fusion is a nuclear process, you know, so an interaction between the nuclei of atoms that happened at the very extreme level of a giant cloud of dust that took up incredible distances, trillions upon trillions of kilometers of distance spread out over open space, originally collapsed into the, the sun and then the leftovers being everything else, okay? So when pulled inwards, the spin increased because the story of the solar system formation wasn't, isn't, isn't just about a collapsing of a cloud, but also about a change in rotation. Notice the initial rotation in this first stage when the, the, the sun has not been born. There's just a bunch of cool, cool gas spread out over some, some portion of space in this vast, vast universe we call home. Okay. So there's this giant cloud of gas and as it collapses in on itself, being pulled from gravity, pulled by gravity, it spins up. It starts rotating faster. This is the same principle that we talked about before, conservation of angular momentum. Conservation of angular momentum. When I say before, I'm referring back to the early chapters on physics and the mechanics of physics. Angular momentum is one of the physical quantities that's conserved in all cases. Since this nebula, this gas became denser and smaller, it spun faster, all right? We see that in our second stage here. By the third stage, it's spinning faster still, denoted by the arrow getting larger in size, that blue circular arrow. So it spins up faster and faster as it condenses. The spinning cloud conformed to the shape of a spinning disk, okay? The theory there is that as the originally spherical cloud Right, so a spherical cloud, I'm going to show in here in 3D, my, my attempt at a sketch of 3D, it would then condense into more of a disk over time, not due, not due to gravity exactly, but to due to the probability of collisions and always one direction being more probable than other directions. And then over time, then all that matter becoming a disk. Okay, because it's spinning in a certain direction, as things bump into each other, they're going to continue to spin in that direction by by chances, all right? The most probable chance after collisions, a bunch of individual particles bouncing together is gonna to be in the direction of the rotation, in the plane of rotation. It becomes a disk, starts as a sphere, becomes a disk, okay? That's where solar systems come from because this theory of solar system formation 
explains our own solar system, can be tested to explain our own solar system, but then can also be applied to other solar systems because we know of many other solar systems. Recent science has shown us hundreds of other solar systems that exist outside of our own. We know some of the properties of the planets around these other stars. And then we can explain that they all formed in the same way from a nebula, a big, cool cloud of gas in open space, okay? So the center of that disk in this nebular theory of solar system formation becomes a protosun. Protosun because fusion hasn't started yet. That's what the proto means, no fusion. It's very hot, very dense, but not hot enough or dense enough to actually fuse the nuclei of matter yet, okay? Away from the center, planetismals are forming because what's left, left now are clumps of matter that aren't part of that protostar. They will then collapse in on themselves. It's like a snowball effect. The bigger piece attracts more matter. It becomes bigger. Then they can attract more matter. That's called a positive feedback loop that, it, that leads to the coalescing of matter, okay? Planetismals are accreted, which means coalesced or um, amalgamated, drawn together, more matter to become planets. Planetismal means like a protoplanet, a small planet. So which of the falling orbits around the sun? Planets, comets, asteroids, or all of the above? It's all of the above. Everything in the solar system either orbits around the sun or orbits around something that orbits around the sun, like a moon orbits around a planet, which orbits around the sun. The sun is the center of all those gravitational systems, okay? As a nebula shrinks under the influence of gravity, according to the nebular theory of solar system formation, it spins slower, spins faster, loses its spin altogether, or spins into a protosun. Which is it? Just spins faster. Spins into a protosun is a misnomer. It's it's not accurate. It doesn't it doesn't spin into a protosun. This protosun is due to the collapse and the the, the the you know the condensing of matter. The increase in spin is independent of that. That's conservation of angular momentum. And it just says that as it becomes smaller, it spins faster. The law of conservation of angular momentum says that. Okay, so let's then talk about the sun. The sun is the nearest star to Earth. Funny thing, right? By far. The closest, or the second closest nearest star is two, or actually three and a half light years away. Three and a half light years away. A light year is an incredibly far distance. Incredibly far, okay? It is composed mostly of hydrogen, okay? In the plasma phase. Plasma means an ionized gas, all right? Ionized. That means that there's no electrons that are actually in orbit around a nuclei. All the atoms are just pure nuclei with the, because it's such a high energy state, all those electrons are bouncing around free of the atom, of the atomic nuclei. Hydrogen is fused into helium because it's so hot and so dense inside the sun that it actually causes fusion. Two protons becoming a helium atom, okay? And that helium atom would have two neutrons and two protons. Like so, okay? And because neutrons get picked up along the way. 4.5 million tons of mass are converted to energy each second. Because in this process, what happens is the mass per nucleon goes down. There's more mass per nucleon in these individual hydrogen, right? Hydrogen plus, because they've lost an the electron, they're both hydrogen atoms. There's more binding energy in that hydrogen than there is in the helium, okay? The helium being double plus because it's also ionized, okay? So since there's more energy in this more matter, which is to say energy, because we're equating energy to matter here with E equals mc squared, that idea then leads to there being energy created from matter, okay? That's the, that's the continuum between matter and energy. They're just different forms of the same thing. Matter is just coalesced energy. Matter can become energy, energy can become matter, but only in very extreme cases. It's not everyday phenomenon, not something biology takes account of, not something that is really happening much at the, um, the level of, say, geology, other than radioactive decay, but that's much less energy. But here, fusion is a huge amount of energy become, coming from the fact that mass is converted to energy. Okay, A tiny fraction of this energy reaches and sustains Earth. Tiny fraction because the sun is radiating energy in all directions. Most of that energy, of course, would miss Earth, right? Earth is tiny compared to the sun and very far away from the sun. As right? so you imagine that, that, that wave of energy spreading out spherically in all directions, some of it crashes over Earth. That's the sunlight that we experience every day that sustains energy on Earth, right? Sustains life on Earth, I should say. 
Okay, strictly speaking, in every second that passes, the mass of the sun does what? Does it decrease, remain constant, increase, or reinvent itself? Well, maybe we can rule out D. It decreases, okay? Because energy is becoming matter, right? Excuse me. <laughs> matter is becoming energy, right? Because in this process of protons fusing together to form helium, we have the actual mass of the sun going down. All right, now that fusion occurs only in the very core of the sun. So even by the time the sun will sputter out and die eventually, it won't be that much less massive. So in fact, this, this mass to energy, although it's, it's huge, many, many tons per second, it doesn't substantially decrease the mass of the sun, even over the billions of years of life of the sun. What will happen with the sun is that it's gonna run out of fusion fusible helium in that core that you, it can't bring in helium from the outer layers. So eventually the sun will blow off those outer layers in a gradual explosion and then have what's left behind, which is a dead core called a white dwarf. Okay. So, but point being is that the mass will decrease slightly over that point, but the sun will still be dead and no longer life sustaining. Okay. It will also wipe out earth in its death throes. Again, that's billions of years in the future. Okay, so speaking of planets that are going to be wiped out in the death throes of the sun in billions of years, we have the inner planets. These include Mercury, Venus, our own Earth, and Mars. There's four of them. These are the four inner planets. They're all rocky. They're composed of high density solid rock. Okay, some higher density than others, some with, you know, slightly different compositions, but they all have a lot in common. The orbital speeds of the planets around the sun decrease with increasing distance from the sun. So that means that Mars is moving slower since it's further away. Earth is moving a little faster, Venus is moving the fastest. As we talk about the gas planets, they are even further, they're moving more, even slower still, okay? Now these, these velocities are still gonna be on the order of 25,000 meters per second. That's the, you know, the orbital speed of a planet around the sun, but it is decreasing with distance, okay? The orbital speed, the velocity. Okay, let's break down each of the inner planets, starting with the one closest to the sun, Mercury, okay? It's slightly larger than our moon, so a very small planet, all right? It is the smallest of the planets by far. It has almost no atmosphere due to its small size, okay? The fact it has an atmosphere at all is really just due to that, I really do, interestingly, to the idea that there's so much energy, so much high energy photons, so light energy hitting the surface of Mercury that it's actually, you know, stirring up particles and kind of creating a constant atmosphere from that bombardment of high energy light, okay? The daytimes are very hot, the nights are very cold. Okay, that's because there's no atmosphere. So once the planet is exposed on its nighttime side, then it, the temperature just falls off because there's nothing to hold in that heat. The fact that our nighttime temperature on Earth isn't hundreds of, hundreds of degrees Celsius less than our daytime temperature is precisely because we have an atmosphere. Now our daytime temperature without an atmosphere would be much less than 430 degrees Celsius because we're much further from the sun, right? L greater distance, less energy, but it would still be hotter than it is now, and our nights would be in the order of negative 90 degrees Celsius. So it'd be freezing cold every, every night. Of course, on Earth, we'd only have to deal with a few hours of that freezing cold, but it still wouldn't be life-sustaining. But, but in Mercury's case, night lasts for some 60 days, all right, or 30 days, because it's, it's a full 60 day cycle, 60 Earth days for one Mercury day. 30, about half of that, 30 of those, are gonna be nighttime in, in, on average, and then that's, that's a very long, very cold night on Mercury, okay? So it's an extre extremely hostile, very cold, extremely hostile environment, okay? Also a lot of radiation because it's close to the sun and there's no atmosphere to protect from that radiation. Remember how we discussed back in our chapter on Earth's atmosphere, Earth's atmosphere absorbs X-rays and ultraviolet light. No atmosphere, no, no absorption of that very harmful light, all right? That light coming from the sun, by the way. Then next is Venus, okay? Next, close to the sun, it's almost Earth's twin in terms of its size, okay? It's also in a similar distance from the, from the sun as Earth, um, so we get a comparable amount of energy from the sun. Now, you know, Venus does get more, right? It's substantially more, but very, within, you know, within kind of what's called the Goldilocks zone, so closest to have, you know, close enough to the sun, but not too far away to support liquid water. Venus could be a lot like Earth, but it's not at all due to some small effects and maybe a chain of reactions happening on the surface of the planet, it has an incredibly dense atmosphere, okay? It's about 50 times denser than the atmosphere on Earth, okay? And that atmosphere, instead of being composed mostly of nitrogen, instead is composed mostly of carbon dioxide. And again, that's because 
N2 is most of Earth's atmosphere, but here we have CO2 in Venus's atmosphere, an atmosphere of almost entirely carbon dioxide. And you may remember carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. If you have an atmosphere of nearly exclusively carbon dioxide, you have an incredibly effective greenhouse, too much so, okay? So because the temperature maintains around a constant 400 degrees Celsius, day and night, with almost no difference. Because it's so dense, there's, it's not letting a lot of energy in, it's mostly reflecting off the upper layers of an incredibly dense atmosphere, and it being the energy from the sun is reflecting across from those upper layers of the atmosphere. The lower layer, layers of the atmosphere, the surface of the planet, is just constantly hot and oppressive. And by hot and oppressive, I mean hot enough to melt some metals. Okay, so very, very harsh environment. And because it's so hot on the surface, volcanism seems to be sustained by those high temperatures. And there's just constant, very low viscosity running lava flows over the entire surface of the planet at any given time. Okay, so now home. A, a, a as under the opposite of Mercury and Venus, a very sheltering environment, a paradise for life. Okay, third planet from the sun. It's at a distance where most of its water is neither solid nor gas, but liquid, okay? And we can see that Venus is kind of outside of that a little bit. It's a little bit too close, right? Mars is arguably where liquid water could be sustained, but it's more likely for water to be frozen on Mars, okay? So the so-called habitable zone I referred to a minute ago as the Goldilocks zone, because it's the just right distance from our particularly sized star, our sun, okay? Next up, now, we're not talking much about Earth, by the way, because we already spent a bunch of chapters talking about Earth. So next up is Mars. Fourth planet from the sun, last of the inner planets, last of the terrestrial planets, a potential away from home habitat, right? Mars could sustain life, right? It would need an atmosphere and Mars does not currently have much of an atmosphere. It's a very thin atmosphere. So there have to be significant changes to his atmosphere, changing the entire atmosphere of a planet, even a planet that is about half earth size would be an undertaking that seems, you know, almost impossible for humans to, uh, to accomplish, but perhaps in the future we could, all right? So its atmosphere is about 95% carbon dioxide and about 0.15% oxygen, okay? It's, it has a thin atmosphere and it's ineffective, that thin atmosphere, ineffective, in reducing the temperature difference between day and night. That means that the temperatures range from about 30 degrees, that's the warmest, which is comfortable, of course, or, you know, on the hot side, to negative 130. So the nights are always cold on Mars. The good news that an, is that a night on Mars is just as long as an Earth night on average, okay? It's about the same you know, rotation around its axis that for this, you know, this half size planet, okay, half Earth size. So those nights, although being incredibly harsh, are survivable in certain habitats, you know, perhaps underground or in a well sheltered um, base of some sort, right, a Mars base. And it's presently the focus of planetary exploration, right, the United States, China, um, European Space Agency, everyone's interested in going to Mars, sending humans to Mars, currently sending sophisticated rovers to Mars, a lot of, a lot of interest in Mars, okay. Here are some examples of rovers on Mars. Of course, we most recently have the Perseverance ro ro uh, rover navigating the surface of Mars. This is Curiosity, I believe, shown here. Okay, so now on to the outer reaches of the solar system. Out here, the planets are very different. They're not rocky planets that may or may not have atmospheres, thin or otherwise. Instead, they're giant gassy planets, okay? They're low density worlds. Their densities are just a little bit more than water, so maybe on the order of 100 1,100 kilograms per cubic meter, right? Water, of course, being 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, all right? In fact, you may remember, I shouldn't say of course, but it's a, it's a well-known number in the physical sciences, the density of water. Saturn is actually slightly less dense than the density of water. It's the only planet that would float if you had an ocean big enough to float a planet, all right? They're all a lot larger than Earth. Neptune is the smallest of all the gassy planets, and it's about 50 times the size of Earth, okay? Now you look at a planet like Jupiter, and I think it's 250 times the size of Earth, okay? So they're more widely spaced than the inner planets. So if I was to draw the inner planets, I draw them as little dots that are sort of spaced here, of course, relative to the sun, all right? And then the, the, the outer planets then would start being spaced with um, having Jupiter, maybe on the scale of about this big, right? At about, about that distance from Mars over here. And then further out, you'd have Saturn would be the next one, which would be a little bit smaller and maybe would fit over here right, at this scale, because you see there's a huge gap then, you know, relative to the first of the gas of the gas planets to the next of the gas planets. And then it certainly would not fit on the page or on the screen. If I was to draw them the gap to Uranus, 
well, then it's actually double this. So you take this distance between Jupiter and Saturn and double it again, because as we get out to the edge of the solar system with Uranus and Neptune being those very distant gas planets, the distance continues to double. So then, you know, going from Uranus and Neptune, it doubles again. Not exactly, but the idea is it gets the distance become much greater to get much greater. Okay. And the four planets, by the way, are in order from distance from the sun, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Okay. So Jupiter is the first of the outer planets, okay? It's beyond Mars, so it's the next one. It's more than 11 times Earth's diameter, which means it's about 250 times the volume, okay? That's where that number came from, because, of course, if you think of the volume of a sphere, it's going to be um, four-thirds pi r cubed, so it's a relationship of taking 11 and cubing it, all right? So um, the composition is more liquid than gaseous or solid, okay? So there's some gas at the upper layers, solid at the very core, but it's mostly liquid. It's mostly almost like a, a metallic ocean of sorts. The atmospheric pressure is more, excuse me for making this hard to read here, it's more than a million times that of Earth's, okay? So much, much greater pressure and where it depends at what depth, but the point is that due to the high gravity and the incredible amount of cloud layers above, it's, it's crushing amounts of pressure on a planet like Jupiter, right? Here's an image of Jupiter. It has particular rusty colors due to the composition of its clouds and those multiple layers of cloud clouds make the different shades all right so the atmosphere is 82 percent hydrogen the entire planet is mostly hydrogen including its atmosphere right helium is the next most common then methane and then ammonia okay this is true of all the gas giants methane and ammonia play a bigger role in the compositions of uranus and, and neptune but they're they're present in all four of the gas planets hydrogen and helium are the most important players by far okay the fact that there's a lot of atomic hydrogen, right? You know, or, you know, I guess molecular hydrogen, H2, existing in a planet is just a testament to the fact that Jupiter formed over from icy pieces of hydrogen compounds and was able to attract an incredible amount of gas due to its large size, something that a planet like Earth was not able to do. And that hydrogen was just either pushed away and captured by Jupiter or pushed out of the solar system entirely in those first few hundred million years of the solar system formation. So that the hydrogen could it would be pushed away by the solar wind by the sun the sun energy itself okay so but we see it retained this you know this fundamental hydrogen retained in the case of jupiter and when i say fundamental hydrogen i'm hinting an idea there we'll talk about in our very last chapter the idea of the big bang but the origin of the universe itself a much, much bigger question than the origin of the solar system but the origin of the universe itself started with all hydrogen okay um and you know, a lot of uh, a lot of coughing, um, you know, uh, atmosphere there, right? Really harsh, harsh methane and ammonia. There's no definite surface um, as it, uh, as occurs on the inner and ro inner rocky planets. So just be clear there: all the gas planets don't have a surface. The, the the cloud layers just get denser and denser until they eventually phase change due to high pressure into a liquid. But it's a gradual process. The solid core is iron, nickel, and other other uh, minerals. So those dense minerals that exist on the terrestrial planets also exist on the gas planets, but they've all sunk to the very core of the planet. Okay, and because of its thick atmos atmospheric blanket, the daytime and nighttime temperatures are about the same for equal altitudes above its surface, whatever you might call that, or equal depths into the cloud layer. All right now, Jupiter is famous for its moons, among many things, and it has four very large moons. In fact, the largest of all of its moons, which is Ganymede, shown here, Ganymede, is larger than Mercury. It's a moon that's larger than a planet. The second largest of Jupiter's moons is um, going to be Callisto. Okay. Then there is Io, which is famous for its volcanoes. And then there is Europa, which is famous for its frozen layer of ice. And beneath that ice, um, very strong evidence supporting that there is an ocean. A liquid water ocean, but you know, some yeah, basically H two O, a huge ocean that spans the entire moon underneath a layer of ice. All right, like a like a melted glacier with water underneath. All right, so Jupiter's moon Europa has an ice capped ocean, which may hold extraterrestrial life. Right, and this is a big may, but if there's a likely place to look, it would certainly be Europa, or a moon of Saturn known as Enceladus. Okay, so the idea then is that the ice is floating on a very deep very large ocean that covers almost the entire moon, okay? Now, the moon itself is a terrestrial, it's rocky, so it's got rocky interior and a metal metallic core like a like our own moon or like a terrestrial planet, but of course, it's a moon of a gas planet, not a planet in its own right, all right? So on to the next gas planet, Saturn, famous for its rings, okay? All right, 
It is very easily seen rings. It can be um, seen with a you know a small hobby telescope. Um, they're quite striking. All right. It is twice as far from Earth as Jupiter. That's the idea that it's you know we're doubling the distances. The diameter is about ten times that of Earth. Okay. Remember Jupiter was eleven, so that means that uh, Saturn is slightly smaller than Jupiter. Okay. Now that does exclude the rings. That would be this diameter here, by the way. All right. The ring diameter is not included. Jupiter also has very faint rings that aren't easily visible, and they're actually not visible at all in the visible spectrum of the electromagnetic spectrum. They only emit um, a infrared type of light. So you'd have to use an infrared camera to see Jupiter's rings, but they're there. It is the low, lowest density of all the planets. As I mentioned, it's the only one that can float. Saturn is surrounded by rings that are hypothesized to be bits of a moon never formed or remnants of a moon that's torn apart by tidal forces. Tidal forces being the same tidal forces that create tides on Earth. The idea that, that a moon pulls on a planet, a planet pulls back, that then causes movable um, you know, material on the surface of either world to get sloshed back and forth. That's why we have tides due, uh, of our liquid oceans here on Earth due to our own moon. Okay, So same idea here, that those forces can be so great that they actually could tear apart rock and thus tear apart an entire moon. Okay, we're not in danger of tearing apart our own moon. Earth is not going to tear apart its own moon due to tidal forces. It's just not big enough. But Saturn being, of course, you know, 10 times the diameter of Earth has huge amount of forces and it can tear apart small moons. And there's a lot of ongoing research into the you know, rings of the diff different you know, uh, gas planets, including Saturn's. The inner part of the rings, like any satellite, travel faster than the outer parts of the ring system. Rocks that make up the rings orbit independently of other rocks that would certainly tear apart a moon that tries to form there. That being said, there are small moons that persist inside of the rings of Saturn, okay? Saturn's largest moon is much smaller than the small ones, or much larger than the small ones I just mentioned. It's known as Titan, which is an appropriate name. It's a very large moon, comparable to the size of Io, Callisto, Ganymede, and Europa, which we talked about, the four biggest moons of Jupiter. And by the way, the other moons of Jupiter don't really compare in size. There's the four really large ones. For Saturn, there's just, very, there's just one large moon, although there are, are some other you know, smaller rocky moons. Titan, however, is quite remarkable because it has an atmosphere. It actually has clouds. It has flowing liquid on its surface. But the rain isn't water. The rain is methane. All right? It rains methane in very much colder temperatures than the atmosphere of Earth. Uranus is the next of the gas planets. Planets. It is twice as far from Earth as Saturn is, so we're doubling the distance. The diameter is about four times that of Earth, which makes it 50 times the volume. It has a 98 degree tilt, so that means that it orbits along an axis that's completely knocked over. And I think knocked over is the best way to think about it. It's its most unusual feature. It's really as if the planet formed with the whole spinning gas cloud that was the nebular theory of solar system formation, and was everything was spinning in the same direction. All the planets, by the way, orbit in the same direction as viewed from above or below, for that matter. But you know, due to that that conservation momentum as everything formed. But then, Sat but excuse me, Uranus does not because Uranus is knocked on its side. Well. We suspect that maybe there was a huge collision with something the size of Mars at some point that knocked the planet on its side. Because you can think about you know, the energy that would in induce, and perhaps that's why Uranus rotates that way. No other theory quite explains why it does. It does have a faint ring system. Now, unlike Saturn and Jupiter that had those the hydrogen helium atmospheres, its atmosphere is mostly methane. By the way, much like the atmosphere of Titans, although Titans, you know, sustains, you know, this idea of actual, you know, terrestrial features flowing water because it has a solid surface, Uranus does not have a solid surface, just like Saturn and Jupiter do not have solid surfaces. It's entirely a gas planet, all right? But it does have a methane atmosphere, and it's it's the coldest of all the gas planets, which you might think would be reserved for the next one, next planet in order, Neptune, because Neptune is significantly further from the sun than Uranus, but Uranus is actually colder. Right? Maybe because it lost some of that energy in the collision. But that's just a guess. A guess. Well, on to the last planet, as in the one that's furthest from the sun. That's Neptune. It lies well beyond Uranus's orbit. Its diameter is almost four times that of Earth, which is somewhat smaller than Uranus. So again, in grouping size, Jupiter and Saturn are similar in size. And then we have Uranus and um, uh, excuse me, Neptune that are also similar in size to each other. But Uranus and Neptune are collectively much smaller than Saturn and Jupiter. The atmosphere is mainly hydrogen and helium, so less methane, but it's still there. And it has a highly elongated elliptical path around the sun. So all of the other planets have nearly circular orbits. They're not perfectly circular, but you know, if you have the, the sun at the center, put the sun right here, 
Well, the orbits of these planets are mostly circular, as my sketch show, has shown here. Take uh, J for Jupiter, for example. But when we get to Neptune, Neptune is the one notable exception. It has a highly eccentric orbit. So it's going to look something like this, right? So that would be its orbit path shown here with little arrows, right? So it has a very elliptical, or in other words, eccentric, it's a term given to this type of orbit, around the sun. All right, last up is Pluto. Pluto is not a planet, it's a dwarf planet, okay? That happened in 2006 when it was reclassified as a dwarf planet. And now we only have eight planets in the solar system. Pluto is simply not a planet. The reason for this reclassification was because there are actually other dwarf planets out there that are further away than Pluto. And they're, they're kind of, they all are grouped together. They're more similar to comets and to asteroids than they are to planets. That's the reclassification. All right, so very unlike other planets in its composition, size, and orbit, it has a highly elliptical orbit like Neptune's, but even slightly more elliptical. It really behaves more like a comet. It spends most of its orbital time well beyond Neptune in a region of the solar system called the Kuiper Belt. That refers to the, the stretch of the solar system that is away from Neptune, all right, outside of Neptune's orbit. Its composition is, li is like that of other Kuiper Belt objects, all right? That's why it's classified with them, see, all right? It has look-alike neighbors that are not classified as planets. There are other ones, Make Make is, is, one, is one of the other dwarf planets. Former planetary status was more historical than astronomical, all right? So it makes more sense to have it classified as something else, not a planet. So which planet is more dense than water? Venus, Mars, Neptune, or all of the above? All of the above. The only one that wasn't was Saturn. See, tricky question. Okay, so now on to Earth's moon. Okay, now we've talked about other moons briefly, but let's talk a little bit more about our own close to home moon. All right, is more is known about the moon than any other celestial body, okay? So we know a lot about the moon, or maybe we're, we're catching up by learning a lot about Mars, but we can study the moon because it is much closer than Mars, much closer. Its diameter is about one quarter that of Earth, okay? So it, which means that its diameter is about one half that of Mars. It has no atmosphere at all. Right? No weather and erosion to conceal past scarring of its surface, which is why it has so many craters. Every little impact is recorded. And its surface of the, of the moon is basically a very, very fine dust called the regolith. Twelve people have stood on the moon. Here we see Buzz Aldrin, one of the three Apollo 11 astronauts. Okay? The formation of the moon is theorized as happening from a large impact. You might notice a theme here. I mentioned a large impact for the theorized explanation why Uranus is knocked on its side, large impacts are kind of an easy way to go in explaining odd phenomenon or odd observations in the solar system, but perhaps we need to find better ones in some cases. But some evidence does support that indeed the moon would have formed from a large collision that happened very early in Earth's history. A Mercury-sized planetesimal crashed into Earth, basically disintegrated, as did a big chunk of Earth. Earth was um, returned to a completely molten state. It would have started from a cooled surface like it has today, but it would have been completely turned back to lava. Nothing would have survived this um, if there was any life living on the surface. And then big pieces of material would be flung with enough velocity to attain orbital status around Earth then that matter, which then had enough velocity to be orbiting around Earth, never returning to Earth's atmosphere, then would coalesce, would then pull together by gravity, and then become the moon. Now, all the, the remnants that were too far away to coalesce into the moon eventually would get disrupted by other asteroids, or eventually gradually get pulled in, or eventually achieve an orbit where they would escape Earth's pull um, indefinitely. But the point being, most of it then would become the moon. That means that the moon should have a composition similar to the surface of Earth because most of what would have been broken off would have been the lighter matter, not the matter from the core of the planet during the collision because the collision would never have reached the, the complete core. And indeed, when we look at the, the data that, of the density of Mars due to its mass and its dynamics, we see that it is actually less dense, supporting the idea that it was formed of only surface material, which then definitely directly supports this idea of a collision forming the moon. The moon is also very large for a planet like Earth, based in comparison to other terrestrial planets in our own solar system, the other three. And that makes you wonder, why, does, why, is, why is Earth the only terrestrial planet with a large moon? Perhaps because it was the only planet that was smashed into in such a large dramatic collision. Now, interesting thing about the moon is it has phases. It's very interesting to understand these phases and kind of important because it's an everyday observation. We can look up at the sky so often and see the moon. The phases of the moon, starting from the full moon, are the waxing gibbous, 
all right, to the first quarter, oh, sorry, wrong direction, please excuse uh, my error there. So starting with the full moon, the next would be waning gibbous, because we're going in this direction, as shown here by this blue arrow, you can see here. All right, so we're going in the counterclockwise direction. Everything in orbital science is counterclockwise, right? That's just the entire solar system rotates counterclockwise. Planets orbit the sun counterclockwise, moons orbit planets counterclockwise, okay? So we have waning gibbous, last quarter, waning crescent, then onto the new moon, then the moon starts to grow, it becomes the waxing crescent, the first quarter, then the waxing gibbous, returning to the full moon. That's the full cycle, okay? Starting from full, returning back to full. Now, of course, the numbers here support the starting, we would start from the new moon, but no matter where you start, you come back to where, where you began. Notice waxing means growing, so growing, so a, a waxing crescent is a crescent that's going to become larger the next day. Eventually, it'll become large enough to become a first quarter, for example, right? Then, in between a quarter and a full moon is a gibbous moon. A waxing gibbous is a gibbous that's on its way to becoming full, all right? But then waning means shrinking, of course. So then we have a gibbous moon again, which is greater than, greater than you know, a quarter. And then it's shrinking down until it becomes the last quarter, right? And then it's waning still when it's a crescent until it comes to a new moon. A new moon is an invisible moon. We don't see a new moon, all right? Now, new moons rise and set with the sun, okay? They're directly in line with the sun. They ri that's why we don't see them. They also, that also means that the, reflect, the side of the moon that's reflecting all of the moon's sunlight is facing away from us. That's why the moon appears to be dark. On the other hand, the full moon is when the moon is on the opposite side of us relative to the sunlight. That's why we see an entirely reflected side and we see the full moon, all right? Now, of course, then, we would see that full moon directly overhead at midnight, right? But again, the moon is visible because the full moon rises when the sun sets and sets when the, when the sun rises. So it's exactly out of sync with the sun. So again, new moons are synchronized with the sun. Full moons are exactly not synchronized with the sun, okay? And then, every, and then there's everything in between, the phases I already mentioned, okay? Now, the moon spins about its polar axis as it revolves around Earth. Okay, so the moon isn't just fixed in place. The moon is also spinning around its axis, just like we're spinning around our axis. We spin around our axis with a period of 24 hours, right? It takes us 24 hours to spin around our axis. That's why, you know, the sun rises and sets. And that's also why the moon rises and sets. But the interesting thing about the moon's spin around Earth is it's spinning at a rate where it takes about 28 days to make a full rotation. Well, 28 days is also how long it, make, it takes to make a full orbit. Since those two times are almost exactly the same, that means that Earth is rotating and orbiting at the same rate. That means that it always has the same side of its celestial body, the same side of the moon, is always facing us, okay? That's called a tidal locked orbit, okay? So tidal locked. Okay, so during the time of a new moon, the sun, is between Earth and the Moon, the Moon is between Sun and the Earth, or the Earth is between the Sun and the Moon? Or is it none of the above? Well, it's that the Moon is between the Sun and the Earth. That's a new Moon. That's when the side of the Moon that's reflecting all the sunlight is invisible to us because it's facing away from us. Okay? So during the time of a full Moon, is the Sun between Earth and the Moon? Is the Moon between the Sun and the Earth? Or is the Earth between the Sun and the Moon? Or is it none of them? Well, you got it? It's C. The Earth is between the sun and the moon. Now the moon is on the far side. We only see it at night. And the side that's facing us is reflecting all the sunlight. That's why it's full, right? It also means that that full moon, in a given rotation of Earth around its own axis, the 24-hour period, it would rise right around sunset, and it would set right around sunrise. All right? Now, another thing about Earth's moon is a magnetic compass aligns with the magnetic field. Like a compass in a magnetic field, the moon aligns with Earth's gravitational field. All right, so see how it lines up, all right? That creates that tidal effect that pulls the moon into that tidal rotation. The moon also leads to eclipses because when there's a new moon and that moon is between the earth and the sun, it can block out the sunlight. Why? Well, due to the much smaller distance, about 60 earth radii to the moon and about 250 million kilometers, so 250 times 10 to the 6 kilometers, so very, very different numbers, all right? And by the way, an Earth radius is about 6,000 kilometers. 
So then 60 Earth radii is three, 360,000, right? So this number here is 360,000 kilometers. So we can see that 250 million is a much bigger number than 360,000 kilometers. In other words, the sun is much further away from Earth than the moon is from Earth. And that means that because the moon is also so much smaller than the sun, that both of those objects have the same angular size, theta here representing the angle. So the angle that the moon takes up in the sky is exactly the same as the angle that the sun takes up in the sky. That means that the moon can exactly block out the sun. That creates a solar eclipse. That, again, only happens on new moons because the moon must be between Earth and the sun. A lunar eclipse, on the other hand, only happens on full moons when the moon is opposite the Earth relative to the sun. And in that case, what's happening is the moon is passing through Earth's own shadow which then makes the moon turn red because the only light that's reaching the moon, excuse me there, the only light that's reaching the moon is the light from Earth's sunsets around the edge of the planet because then that light would be kind of bouncing off and making its way to the moon, all right? So the red light of the sunrise and sun sunsets all around Earth are refracted, bent through the atmosphere, and then are then reflected off of the, um, the surface of the moon, and we see them when we look up at a lunar eclipse, all right? So, Couple other things about the solar system, failed planet formation. These are the leftovers. The planets themselves are the leftovers from the, the nebula that became the proto-sun proto and eventually became the sun. But then the leftovers from the leftovers are the asteroids and the comets, all right? Asteroids are small rocky bod bodies that orbit the sun. Most are located between Mars and Jupiter. That's the asteroid belt. So if we have Mars and we've got Jupiter out here, then in between is the asteroid belt, all right? So a bunch of asteroids that exist, asteroid belt, okay? They actually exist due to gravitational tugging from Jupiter that prevents the planet from forming, all right? Some encounter Earth, okay? Sometimes they get pulled in on, on um, unique orbits due to uh, gravitational interaction between planets. They're unnoticed on the ground, conspicuous, um, conspicuous on ice, the reason many are found in, in Antarctica, okay? Because they, they just don't, you don't notice them right? If, a, if an asteroid hits the ground, it just becomes a rock, and it's hard to distinguish it from other rocks. Comets, on the other hand, differ from asteroids in their chemical composition, okay? Kind of similar in size because they're mostly water, right? Now, not just H2O, but other hydrogen compounds. They have methane and ammonia, all right? They're like dirty snowballs because there are heavier elements, some, some carbon, for example. They're mostly located in the Kuiper belt, the same place that Pluto is located, and the Oort cloud, the Oort cloud being about 50 times further from the sun than the Kuiper belt. All right. They have highly elliptical, which is to say highly eccentric orbital paths, kind of like Neptune and Pluto. And they have tails when they get near the sun because they start evaporating. They start boiling away their surface. And then that leaves a tail of ionized gas or other reflective material behind the comet. All right. And that tail gets swept out by the solar wind as well as by photon collisions, so actually by um, um, energy of light. OK, and we can see that here. So we, here we can see a comet coming in. So let's follow this comet on a um, interestingly um, a clockwise orbit, which would be unusual for a comet, but not impossible. They, they're not not all comets are, are counterclockwise like all planets are. And the nucleus at some distance about kind of like the asteroid belt distance. So sort of when a comet becomes um, close enough to the sun that it's about as far away as Mars, the nucleus of that comet begins to sublimate, which means the solid material starts to boil away. Um, nucleus isn't re referring, to, referring to atomic nucleus or anything. It's just the, the core of the comet is called the nucleus. Then the, a gas coma begins to form around that, um, that comet at a distance of about five astronomical units. An astronomical unit is that 250 million kilometers I mentioned a minute ago. It's a distance between Earth and the sun, right? This is one astronomical unit, okay? So that's when a comet starts to get a, essentially an atmosphere around it. Comets can be on the order of a couple hundred kilometers in diameter. Some can be larger, maybe even a thousand kilometers in diameter, like a sixth of, of Earth's, Earth's uh, own diameter. But many are just going to be maybe 100 kilometers or 30 kilometers in diameter. Okay. But the point is they get a small atmosphere called a coma. Then the tails begin to form. So the tails form at about one astronomical unit, about as far as Earth is from the sun on average. All right. And this tail points away from the sun. And then a second tail begins to form when the comet gets even closer, which only happens with some comets, obviously. And then this second tail is the so-called dust tail. Um, notice that the first was the, um, actually, where's the label for it? The first is the plasma tail. There's a name for it. 
all right? So the plasma tail forms first, the dust tail forms second. Plasma just means ionized gas. Dust is what it sounds like, heavier particles, more massive. The dust tail gets swept away due to its own inertia, whereas the plasma tail gets pointed straight back from the solar wind, which is mostly going to be electrons that are being pushed away from the sun that actually directs the plasma because they're, it's ionized and charged and thus interacts, all right? The dust, the dust tail is really only getting pushed by, um, is unaffected by solar wind because it's not charged, not ionized, and it's only getting pushed by actual um, photons, by the, pho like the energy of light, because uh, um, light carries a small amount of momentum. And so when the light bounces, it bounces into the thing, it actually pushes in a tiny bit. So that dust tail gets pushed a little bit, but mostly gets bent away from the plasma tail. That's why comets are often shown of two visible tails. There's also a third invisible tail, which is larger particles. By the way, those larger particles get just, you know, get pulled directly in the direction um, of inertia. So they just they just trail behind the comet and they get left behind. And so then Earth can, will pass through that leftover larger pieces, that larger debris, the larger particles. And those are then periodic annual meteor showers, because every time Earth passes through that leftover region of space with a bunch of little leftover pieces of, of the comet, they burn up as, as Earth kind of flies through them because they're kind of gradually sitting there, getting moved very slowly. So every year we have these regular meteor showers from leftover comet passages. Asteroids are small rocky bodies that do what? Do they orbit the sun, mainly reside between Mars and Jupiter, are smaller than Earth's moon, or do all of the, all of the above apply? Well, of course, it's all of the above. These are all good descriptions for asteroids. Now the tails of comet, comets point in a direction towards the sun, away from the sun, at nearly right angles to the sun, or none of the above. Well, best answer is away from the sun. Now, obviously the dust tail points less directly away from the sun, and the plasma tail points really directly away from the sun, but they're both angled away to some degree. Now, again, I mentioned the idea of meteor showers, annual events from leftovers from a comet. Also, asteroids themselves can get, um, get pulled into Earth's orbit, and that can then lead to a couple of things called meteoroids and meteors. Well, what are those? Well, meteors, although second here on the list, are the first you would notice. The meteor is actually the event of a small asteroid or comet remnant that enters Earth, Earth's atmosphere, and that streak of light across the sky is the meteor, often called a falling star. Falling star. Most of those completely disintegrate, so they're turned into a, a vapor of some sort in the atmosphere, usually the upper atmosphere. But some of them have an, a dense enough core that it passes down into the troposphere, hits the ground, gets embedded in the ground, usually completely lost, unless, of course, you're in the Arctic and it stands out in the snow. And then you have a sand-sized, um, or maybe up to boulder-sized piece of debris that actually lands on the ground and is left over. So the actually leftover rock is called the meteoroid. Okay, where the meteors is the event, and they come from asteroids. A meteorite is a meteoroid that survives the trip through Earth's atmosphere. So, I, so let me say that. Let me say this a little differently. The meteorite is the actual leftover rock. This is the thing that you'd find on the surface. The meteoroid is the actual piece that comes into the atmosphere. Atmosphere. So please let me correct this. Meteoroid is the the piece of a, a comet or maybe a piece of an asteroid, but usually a chunk of a comet that actually enters the atmosphere. So when it's in space, it's the meteoroid. If it reaches the ground and there's some left over, that's the meteorite, the remaining rock. So which of these makes contact with Earth's surface? Is it the meteor, the meteorite, or the meteorite? Certainly clears it up. It is, it is one of those, so we'll rule out D. Which is it? It's the meteorite. Right, if you remember, is a, a common suffix for rocks. We saw it a lot, a lot in our geology chapters. So here we have a meteorite, the actual space rock, the thing that came from, usually a remnant of a comet, hit, hit Earth, made it to the surface, okay? Meteoroid was when it was still in space. The meteor is just the event, seeing the, the streak across the sky. All right, well, we covered all of the pieces, the, the different classifications of the solar system. Hopefully it was a good introduction to astronomy. We're gonna zoom out much further away and talk about stars other than our own sun and galaxies a bit in the next chapter. So please stay tuned to that. Bye for now.